Um, okay, we're going to start. Um, good afternoon, everyone from a cold, from a cold London. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, good evening to those who are joining us from Israel, or from South Africa. Um, it's just gone. Good afternoon to those in the US. Um, welcome to all of you to um, this webinar um, hosted by the Hebrew Order of David International. Um, my name is Adrian Basker. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm an actuary uh, professionally, and um, COVID-19 has certainly kept us actuaries extremely busy. Um, but I think today's webinar is not about the numbers. Um, today's webinar, we're going to examine COVID-19 from two completely different perspectives. Um, number one, we're going to get a, a really deep insight into the human side and the suffering um, and the miracle. Um, miracles that come out of um, COVID-19, as well as some insights from a clinical point of view um, behind the pandemic. Um, our two speakers, I'm going to introduce both of them now, um, and then we'll go into it. So our two speakers, uh, firstly, um, and he calls himself Miracle Boy. Um, so Eli Seliger um, has a remarkable story of survival of COVID-19. Um, Eli will be our first speaker. Um, Eli is a father of seven. Um, he's a grandfather of three. Um, he was a previously healthy and energetic 53 years young. Um, during COVID, he spent nine weeks in a coma, um, more than 20 weeks in hospital, plus a number of weeks in uh, rehabilitation. Um, along the way, uh, he was given very little chance of survival. Um, he's here today to tell us the story. Um, Eli is a property developer and a contractor. Um, he's also a very active member of the Hebrew Order of David and a brother in the Lodge. Um, and he's also the UK chairman of the Zikron Menachem charity. Um, Zikron Menachem is a charity who supports children with cancer in Israel and the UK. And I'm going to come back to a little bit more to Zikron Menachem um, in a few minutes' time. Um, our second speaker today um, is one of my colleagues. Um, is Dr. Luke James. Um, some of you will have joined a webinar that we hosted uh, way back in April last year, which um, Dr. Luke and myself did on COVID-19. Um, that It feels like a long time ago. Um, Dr. Luke is medical director for Bupa's uh, insurance business, um, both in the UK and for Bupa Global. Um, he's a qualified doctor, having qualified at UCL in 1998. He has over 20 years experience in both the National Health Service and private practice. Um, he holds multiple qualifications um, in psychology, forensic medicine, um, insurance. He's a med medical educator and an appraiser. Um, he did 13 years service as a GP. Um, he's been three years as a National Health Service CCG board member. Um, and in, in my organization, certainly, Dr. Luke has become a celebrity, um, holding numerous webinars throughout COVID, educating our clients and brokers on um, all the latest developments on the disease. Um, Dr. Luke will give us the clinical insights and what we know so far. Um, so bef before, before we jump into two speakers, just to provide a little bit of context from, from our side. Um, so th this chart, and as actuaries, we like graphs. Um, so this graph shows the progression of the disease in terms of cases um, per million people in the four countries where most of today's audience is. So in Israel, United States, United Kingdom, and South Africa. Um, a few things to point out from this graph. Um, firstly, this is a seven-day average. Um, so the, the, the effects are a little bit smoothed out. Um, as you can see at the moment, Israel, um, in terms of cases per million, is, is at the highest level. South Africa is at the lowest level. Um, over time, we can see that there has been a consistent gradual increase over the 12-month period. So when we did the webinar for, for the Hebrew Order of David um, back in April, um, we were quite low down on the graph. And since then, um, cases have just grown and grown and grown. Um, it's multiples worse than it was in spring 2020. Um, you can see from the graph, they've been, it's most of the graphs are rolling graphs, so there've been multiple waves of COVID that have hit us. Um, but in all four countries, it's been coming down since the beginning of January 2021, which is a good sign. 
but clearly there is a long, long way to go. And, and um, the, out the outlook is very much influenced by the futures of vaccines. Um, and Dr. Luke will talk a little bit about vaccines. Um, they're on their horizon. Uh, um, and in this graph, the impact of vaccination will not have been seen. So we would expect the impacts of vaccination to continue to influence this graph in the future. Um, th this, this graph just shows a timeline and I'm not gonna talk about every blue box on this, but it just gives you some sense of how things have developed. Um, this is from a UK perspective. Um, so in the UK, the first two cases um, were noticed on the 29th of January um, back in York. Um, uh, in, in February, the first UK transmission happened. Um, on the 23rd of March, which is an important date in today's story, um, the UK entered its first lockdown. And then we can see vaccine style trials started on 22nd of April. Um, it, and then um, we had reopening of places, new lockdowns, new restrictions, tiers, um, vaccines being rolled out. Um, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster ever since. Um, but I think the story today, um, we're going to start the story um, on the 26th of March in Gold is Green. Um, and it's one family story. It's a Seediger family story. Um, and Ellie is going to talk about his story. Um, what I'm going to do is put up a slide, um, a separate slide pack. So if you can bear with me, I'm going to put up Ellie's slides. What's wrong? Who's connected? Um, so I'm, I, before I hand over to Ellie, I'm going to talk a little bit about Zechra Menachem, which is um, one of Ellie's passions um, and um, one of Ellie's miracles. Um, he's going to talk about the other miracle, but uh, Zechra Menachem is a miracle. Um, Ellie was instrumental in bringing 120 cancer children um, and 80 doctors from Israel to the UK for, for a trip of a lifetime to England every few years. Um, the last one was in 2019. Um, it's an amazing Chesed project supported by volunteers from the Hebrew Board of David International. Um, it's one of Ellie's miracles and we're going to start with a clip, a um, very short clip of this in a minute, um, taken on the visit in 2019. Um, Ellie, um, yeah. what a miracle and what a wonderful thing that you did in um, organizing this event. Um, and so sort of I'd like to welcome you and for the first time 
um, in public um, to tell us your story um, from March 2020 onwards. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to everybody. This is an absolute miracle. And I'm going to try and take you through my journey of my recovery. First of all, I'd like to thank the HOD for hosting this evening. My association with them has been for over 15 years. Not only do they sponsor a day, but when we do have the day, at least over 70 volunteers join in and help and allow us to make that a special day for these kids. And generally, when we do a consensus, the Sunday that HOD has sponsored comes up on tops. So it's great to have you guys on board and to be doing this with you tonight. The lesson, the message that I'd like to give tonight is hope and don't despair. It's hard work, it's belief, and lots of tefillah prayer. There's loads of self-motivation and really no pity. I'd say to all, unfortunately, if you are in this situation or if you know that somebody that's in that situation is use all that is made available to you and don't feel in any way stigmatized. Respect the guidelines and appreciate that we don't always understand why and how. Not all our questions in life are answered and not all of them need answers. My motto is look back at what you have achieved, look forward to what you may achieve. Thursday, the 27th of March, at 11.32, there was a knock on our front door. My sons opened the door and there was Bobby standing. Is your father all right? They answer him, no, he's actually been quite unwell for the last week, coughing and a very high temperature. I said, okay, I've come to check him out. Within no time, Bobby checked me. My stats were below 88. He gave me oxygen, they fell again. In a few minutes, he called for backup and lo and behold, my cousin Esri arrived in the Hatsola ambulance. Be honest with you, I don't recall much from that Thursday night and I don't recall much from that Friday, but I do remember seeing Dr. Benji Schreiber, an old mate of mine, a boy who had played in my band. I said to him, Benji, you here, that must be an act of God. You're a messenger. We discussed, we concluded that there was no other way other than going on the ventilator. Within minutes, I had seven astronauts standing by my side in my room and they started introducing themselves. I said to them, guys, I don't need the introductions. You're all the messengers of God. I chanted, Ein oid mil vadoi. I'm not alone. And that was the beginning of the nine week ordeal. I missed Pesach, I missed Shavuot. And in the meantime, I had lost 30 kilos. Leah, my wife, was given the worst scenarios, the worst status quo. If I wake up, I might be a vegetable. If I wake up, I might be paralyzed, but don't expect him to wake up. Telephone calls went backwards and forwards. Rabbi Greenberg told Leia, you can take the phone on Shabbos. You can make the phone call to the hospital. You can accept the phone calls from them. The rabbis, all of them were amazing. They called daily. They called on Arab Shabbat. Rabbi Greenberg, Dan Aaron Troy, who should be well, and his wife, Rabbi Chaim, they were there as guidance. They were there with sympathy. Shortly after this, a name was added. Rufal Achonan Shimon Ben Bela. After I came out of hospital and I started walking, people stopped their cars and introduced their children to me. Ah, there's Ben Bela, came a household name. While all this was going on, Tehillim groups 
were set up nationally and internationally. The HOD had their own to Helium group. Nightly to Helium calls at 7.30 p.m., sometimes 300 people on the phone. Speakers from all over the world were appointed, were asked to come and speak, come and give, come and give chizuk, come and give encouragement for these hard times. A time the community was united, a time of strength, a time of people had opportunity to daven. Short story. I got a call shortly after I came home from a mother from Israel. And she said, Ellie, you should know that at the time when you and Danny were in hospital and we were davening, we davened for ourselves too. We felt it was a time that we could, we could daven. The connections were open. The pipelines were open to God. They davened, the girl got engaged and they called me. Huh? They called me from, from the wedding to allow me to share in the Simcha when I was lying in rehab. What an amazing story. What an amazing time for Tefillah. Daily Zoom calls to the hospital. Slide. Adrian? Next slide. My screen's frozen. I'm trying to trying to do it. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Daily Zoom calls to the hospital. The family was singing. The family liaison officer commented, "She will never forget the desperate cries of my children, waiting for my response." In this time, next slide. Moishi, our son, decided he launched the Safer, Pro the Safer Torah project. Within 36 hours, all the money was raised, all the funds were collected that were needed to write this traveling Torah scroll. This was to be used for special events and occasions. Another initiative from Adina was the sweet packages. These were handed out to kids to encourage them to make brachot. The fact that somebody would answer them, the fact that somebody would say amen, would be a schus, a merit for Danny and myself for a speedy recovery and a refuah shalema. Next slide. This went national and international. It was a project for all the locals. Next slide. Helping to pack and to distribute. Wednesday, that fateful day, Wednesday, the 29th of April, 12.30 p.m., Leah got a call to come and say goodbye. Leah said, no way, I'm coming to say hello. She begged all, she called, she called to whoever she can to storm the gates of heaven. They drove through every red light on the way. To heal him, round the clock was started. To heal him, groups, individuals, saying to heal him on the roadside. To heal him was said in the middle of standing in a queue in shops. Many commented, this was a moment they will never forget. A time to ask, a time to plead was felt globally. At 4.08, Leah called in to the Tehillim line and said, next slide, play. I just want to say something. This is Leah. Yeah. Just came back from the hospital. Yeah. Um, Baruch Hashem, Ellie pulled through this crisis. He got um, air next to his lungs which Mamash, they came up, loved him, and I'm convinced that it's all the fillers of everyone that pulled him through this. I was allowed to go into him, and I told him 
that we're all governing for him and we need him to come back to us. I need him, my family needs him, my parents need him, our extended family, the cloudy soul, everyone needs him to come back. I want to thank everyone for all your tefillas, for your mitzvahs and Martin Toivin that you're doing, for Fua and Yeshua, for Fuel Khan and Shimon and Bela, and for all the other Choilim, and the Ezra's Hashem. Doctor said the next 36 hours are very, very critical. With everyone's tefillas, Eli will pull through. Thank you very much. Amen. 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 Shortly after I came home, I had a call from Dr. Jim Down. He was requesting permission that he, is in, that he is allowed to put the story of when Leah was called into the hospital into his book that he was writing to be published by Penguin Books. I thanked him for his efforts, but I made it quite clear to him that while he was working very hard with his team, the prayers were being said all over and that together they had managed to save me. And I said to him, I call myself the Miracle Boy. Play. Next slide. Hello, my name's uh, Jim Down. I'm one of the consultants at U University College Hospital, uh, and I was involved in the care of uh, Ellie Seliger last uh, spring. And uh, as I'm sure he said, he was extremely sick for quite a protracted period. But uh, one day that I was looking after him was particularly um, <clears throat> tough. Uh, he came very close to uh, to dying, to be honest. Um, he had a, a leak of air around his lungs, which we drained, but in the meantime, he became very unstable. Uh, and uh, even when we drained it, I was concerned that um, he looked as if he may not, may not make it through the next 24 hours. So I called his wife in um, to tell her. And uh, I remember still now sitting in our relative's room with her and explaining that we were doing everything we could for, for her husband, but despite that concern that he, he was so sick that he wouldn't survive the next few hours. And I remember um, an, overwhelming sense, an overwhelming sense of the, the love she had for him and uh, the you know, desperate desire she had for him to pull through this um, and feeling a bit uh, desperate myself and, and helpless that I couldn't change what I thought was going to happen. Of course, as you know, he, he did survive and um, I think very aptly describes himself as the miracle boy. And, you know, uh, I am, well, I'm just incredibly pleased that he did and, uh, and humbled by his fortitude and, and uh, strength of will to, to make it to where he is. And um, I wish uh, him all the very best tonight and for for the future. Thanks very much, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. I hope, Ellie. Okay, bye bye. On Wednesday, the twenty seventh of May, I opened my eyes for the very first time after nine grueling weeks of fear for all. Unfortunately, for all those round who have asked, I have no recollection. I have no dreams to report. I woke up in wonder, confused, and what's really happened to me. I couldn't feel my leg. I couldn't lift my foot. I didn't recall my wife's name at times. In our daily Zoom meetings, I was confused and started singing Rosh Hashanah songs. I referred to my wife as Jennifer. Every ping disturbed me, thinking it was an Uber. I was desperate for a ring, uh, for a drink. Richard, the liaison officer, said, Ellie, when I can, I'll get you an orange juice, and together we will drink a lechaim. I was shocked that I had lost so much weight. COVID had changed the world. I was alone. There were no visitors and everybody was wearing masks. On 19th of June, I was moved to the ward 
I was a little more alert, but the clock didn't seem to move. The cracks on the wall became more apparent to me. They had informed me about the forthcoming wedding date of my daughter, Michali. As I had a little physio, I was assured. I asked, will I attend this wedding? Can I get there? And they said to me, well, not sure. We'll see. It may be on wheels. It may be a Zimmer frame. And if you're lucky, it may be a stick. I accepted whatever it was. I thought, at least I'll get there. They came with the Sarah Steady every day to do exercise with me. And all I was doing was lifting, standing, moved around to a chair, lifting, standing, a little bit more and a little bit more. And that's the way they built up my strength. The doctors kept doing their rounds. I was hoisted from bed to chair. Shabbos came along. It was very, very lonely. Not nice at all. Shabbos being supposed to be the best day of our week, to me, was no pleasure. More doctor's rounds. Once again, they kept on saying to me, you know, you've been very ill. I said, what? What do you mean I've been very ill? If I've been very ill, then they surely have to thank God for being recovering. The next day, there was a shake on my privacy curtain. Hello, I believe you want to know a little bit more what you've been through. I said, yes. He said, well, it may take an hour or two. I said, okay, look, you know, I might as well know what's going on. Well, he started his list. He started reading. He started looking for more and more details. You've had pneumonia three times. You've had kidney failure. We've diagnosed Adam. Adam is a multiple sclerosis normally found in kids. You'll survive. Encephalitis, lung infection, sepsis, weakness on the left side. Your eyes are blurred. I think that's it. Thanks for telling me. You've had or you've got bilateral optic neuropathy. My, he my left hand was completely numb. It had tingling and constant pain. My three fingers on my right hand, the same. I had blood clots, I had seizures, neuritis. On the 11th of April, they put a tra tracheostomy. I had bl high blood sugars. I had a pneumothorax. And finally, not in his list, but before leaving hospital, I contracted C. diff. C. diff is an infection which often comes from being in hospital for a long time or from an allergy to antibiotics. I was shocked. I was gobsmacked, but I thanked him for the info. I was taking, and I am taking, 21 tablets a day. On the 3rd of July, a physiotherapist appeared, never seen her before and never saw her again. She walked into, the, into my ward and she says, Ellie, today we're going walking. I said, what? I said, how am I supposed to walk? Yesterday, I couldn't lift my foot. Today, you're telling me we're going walking. Luckily, I was in a geriatric ward there were five Zimmer frames around. She took one with the assistance of her other physiotherapists. We got onto the Zimmer frame and I walked three meters. I was excited. I was ecstatic. This was the first steps to recovery. And be honest with you, I never ever thought that I would walk again. It was Danny when he spoke to me from his rehab and he told me that he had walked. That was the encouragement that gave me the chance to do it. If he could do it, so can I. I was lying in the ward one afternoon and a, um, a chaplain comes into me and introduces himself. Very nice. Hi, how are you? He left. 
that evening it came to my mind, hey, I haven't laid tefillin. I don't know where my tefillin are. It was ages since I had put on a pair of tefillin. But I thought to myself, if there's a chaplain, surely that's his job. He can help me. Leia contacted them, and I was blessed with Rabbi Yisro Lu coming to my side. Every day, committed to coming to put on my tefillin. And if he couldn't do it, he arranged somebody else. I couldn't lift my arm to put on my tefillin. I couldn't put my hands up to my head to put on my shorosh. But he came. He was a special, he was a special caring individual. And I thank him. Next slide. Wow, what a smile. This brings back memories. My little girl, my little daughter, Abigail, was having her birthday on the 13th of July. She kept on saying, Dad, are you coming home for my birthday? I said, Abigail, I don't know if I'm coming home, but I will see you. It was that Sunday before her birthday that Leah was allowed in for half an hour to come and visit me. I had no physio, so we took a walk. We came to the matrons and we said to them, my daughter is having her birthday tomorrow. Is there any chance that I will be able to go and see her, to go and see the family? She granted permission. I went down that day, the first time seeing my children in 19 weeks, the first time I'd had some fresh air. The, next slide. The care I got 24 seven was remarkable. Four months on my back, Baruch Hashem, thank God, not a bed sore. Thank you NHS, thank you doctors, and thank you all the nurses for what you did for me. Next slide. After being told three times I was gonna be moved to rehab, finally, after six COVID tests and four long months, I was welcomed at rehab by family and cousins, Henry and Judith, and very emotional staff. This was the 28th of July. I was checked over by the doctor. I told her, you know, I've got a daughter's wedding, which is going to be taking place on the 25th of August. I said, I'd like to go. She said, you know, go. You do video. I said, I yes, go. I know video. The next day, breakfast was offered. I chose cornflakes. And I said to the young lady, by any chance, you wouldn't have a banana. That's how we used to eat cornflakes in South Africa. She says, I'll go to the kitchen and look. She came back. She says, sorry, nothing there. The next day I was sitting at lunch. She comes to me with a banana in her hand and she says to me, Ellie, this is for you for breakfast tomorrow. That afternoon, I asked the nurse to help me once again with my tefillin. It disturbed me, again, having to explain why and what. From the day onwards, from the following day, I started putting on tefillin myself. It was a struggle, but I put it on. On the Friday, I was introduced to one of the nurses. She was a nurse and said, ah, so she explained, she's a Filipino. So I said, where do you know Hebrew from? So, okay, we started learning speaking in, in Hebrew. We got friendly. I struggled with her name. Just then my sister Gila called. Next, next um, slide. 
Just then my sister Gilla called and I said to her, I'm sorry, but I don't remember your name. I'm going to call you Gilla. She laughed, she smiled, and she accepted. There were no visitors allowed in rehab. But again, I got friendly with the nurses. I got friendly with the staff. And they made an allowance. As you can see, I sat by the door. I sat behind the fence. But we still managed to see the, the, the children every so often and carry on planning for the wedding. It was 10 days later that I went to physio and I said to my physiotherapist, you know, you guys are trying to rehab me. My nails are as long as can be. I can't take it. I know I've asked your staff, can you help me with it? They said, no, sorry, staff policy. We're not allowed to cut your nails. I explained to her, I said, you know, this is not fair. My wife can easily come and do it in the garden. No. We don't allow it. Anyway, they had a staff meeting that afternoon. And guess what? All of a sudden, my Bernardo lady turns up and says, do you want your nails cut? I gladly said yes. And I turned around. She turned around to me afterwards and she pointed to me and she said, Ellie, I wouldn't do this for anybody else. They were excited. They were happy. The kids brought in notes, they sent in signs, notes, they displayed them. I got friendly with them and in the end, I had a fan club. And here you'll see me leaving rehab with a standing ovation. Next slide. Thanks. Friday, the 21st of August. Next slide. Wow. What a welcome. I was overwhelmed with the turnout at home. I couldn't believe how many people came to meet me on this emotion-filled day. Over 250 people, a festival, music. Next slide. Five months away, thousands of Tehillim recited, unbelievable level of chesed shown and shared, everyone wanting to be part of this momentous occasion. Next slide. <laughs> The highlight was to dance with my brother Danny. We had spoken many other times, but we had been separated all this time. Next slide. 
You cannot imagine the feeling of being home for Shabbos, surrounded by my wife, my children, and my grandchildren, making Kiddush and having homemade chalas, a dream that came true, a memory of hospital that I never want to repeat. The day that I was desperately waiting for. Next slide. Play. The goal I had set between what hurdles were in front of me. One doctor said, you may not attend. My physio said, you may, but we're not sure how. But Michali, you kept me going. You kept telling me you want me there. Next slide. In my own mind, I said, I will walk you down the aisle. Short aisle it was, but I did it. Gil and Aaron, thanks for looking after me during the dinner, which I wasn't able to attend. Ten weeks after coming home, I was sitting davening shachris. I put my tefillin on and I felt a buzz on my neck. I went to Dr. Adler and he said to me, in his very calm voice, Ellie, I've never seen this before. You need to go to A&E. It was one o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday and off we went. I never dreamt that I have to go back to hospital so soon again. My resilience being tested once again. I went for a CD scan. I went for an ultrasound. Eventually the doctor came to explain to us, you've got a fistula, a, communi a communication between the jugular vein and the, and the artery. Blood traveling in the wrong direction. This could be fatal. He told me he secured a bed for me. I said, doctor, no way. I'm not doing another Shabbos. We spoke, he agreed. He said, we were concerned, but not worried, but you have to have it operated this week. Sunday, 9 a.m., we went back to the hospital. I was admitted to a ward once again, all by myself. As Anton advised me all the way through, Ellie, sit in that chair. Make sure you're not lying down. Your muscles need to work sitting up. All of a sudden, a gentleman walks into my room, suited and booted. He says to me, Ellie, do you recognize me? Before I managed to say yes, before he introduced me, I said, Edgar. He said, yes. He talked. He was an old customer of mine, but he was an ethicist in World Free. He talked, he told me, thank God they've had another child. I phoned his wife when I came out of hospital to compliment her. She says, Ellie, you cannot believe. I've never seen my husband so emotional when he, as when he came home to speak to you as he was at my father's funeral. The matron that was on that day came and introduced herself with the anesthetist for tomorrow. She said to me, Ellie, You've had a rocky ride, a rocky year. We want to make sure that there's a bed for you in ICU when you have your operation. I said, fine, sounds good to me, royal treatment once again. Whoever heard that I'd come to hospital, 
who treated us, the brothers, Danny and myself at the time when we went in, we were there at the same time, we arrived the same night, we were admitted at the same night, on the same night. Those that were there came to say hello. It was nice for them to see somebody still coming back. Statistics have been shown in my age group, only 31% of people that went through ICU got out. In Danny's age group, only 19%. What a miracle. Anyway, finally, the next day I was taken down for the operation at 1 p.m. I was told it's gonna to be three hours. I couldn't believe it. The next morning when I woke up, it was four o'clock in the morning, 15 hours later. I was traumatized. I couldn't speak. I had a tube down my throat. I didn't know why. Nobody told me that this was going to be the way. I'd worked so hard in, re in rehab, being told that, you know, your voice, we tested it. They worked with it. In fact, one of the things that they did is to ask me to sing. And I sang from home. If we remember, anybody that's listening, she couldn't believe. She said, what are you complaining about your voice? She said, I don't know. Anyway, here I was worried that all of a sudden I have a tube in my throat. We've been through all this and now I'm not going to be able to speak again. My throat is my, if I'm going to be speak, is it going to be hoarse? They said to me, they have to wait for the ENT guys to come in and decide when, what it's going to be with this tube. Thank God at 12.30, the tube was removed. I asked for a glass of water. And I said a bracha aloud to everybody around, Shakol near Bidvoro, with all my might, that I could speak again and drank my water. This episode was probably the worst and most traumatic experience in my whole hospital career. Now, some thank yous. My dear wife, my Aisha's Chayo, Leah. Your belief, your emuna. You are the stronghold, the pillar of strength for all. People who came to the door were amazed at how you were able to hold the situation, hold right through. You had to learn the medical terms. You were listening to the doctor's forecasts, but you kept reminding them, not yet. He will walk. He will wake up. He will be able to move. Dealing with finances, the unknown, the kids, Zoom lessons, we all kept going. What a wonderful lady you are. Next slide. My children, and the family, my neighbors, and friends. Your support and encouragement was outstanding. Ruti, Leia's private chauffeur. Judith, the meal coordinator. Rochel, the devoted shopper. All my walking partners who have got me to where I am. Brian Cobran for giving me the belief for helping me to see again with the right glasses. Hannah, my private personal trainer, your commitment, your undeterred, your, the phone rings and you don't answer it, your planned way that you're going to work with me. To Dalia and Michal. Dalia and Michal are my physiotherapists five times a week. Without you, I don't know where I would have been. Dalia, your moral support right the way through, a shoulder to cry on and always giving the right advice. Miriam, my OT, it's only two weeks ago from the message that you sent me. Ellie, why not try davening? Why not try and stand when you're davening? To Anton, 
the rock of my salvation. All those phone calls that you made to me while I was in hospital, when I was in rehab, coming to me on Tuesday nights, the program of exercise that you, that you sorted out. To Wayne for jumping into my business, going onto site and sorting out what was needed for sorting out the daily exercise program. To HRD once again for hosting this evening and of course the bike you hired for me. To Adrian and Lawrence for arranging this evening. To my brother Danny, your example, your strength, you are show me what a fighter really means. To Khani, your moral support and experience of an ICU nurse kept Leia going. That was really very, very important. To Hatsola, the devoted members, to hospital kosher meals and bedside kosher for the food that you provided. During this period, I coined a new phrase. Up to now, I was a giver. Now, I'm a user, but not a taker. Rabbi Greenberg, with the Monks Welfare Fund that you set up to help me, to see us through and to allow us to continue. To Ezra Marpe, their packages that you sent me every Friday was enough to feed, to feed an army. Staff were all impressed. The furniture that you supplied, the accessories that you gave me. WST, Woodstock Sinclair Trust. Every Thursday, there's a collection in Shul. I never dreamt, I never understood where this goes to. But no, it's not just a matter of a collection. You called every week to Leia to see, do we need anything? Does she need anything? How can they help? To all of you tonight who have been with us on this long journey in prayer, in good deeds and support, you have made a difference. You have given me a new lease of life. Shechionu bekiyamonu bekiyonu lazman hazeh. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's absolutely inspiration. And um, yeah, what, what, a, what a story. Um, we are going to take some questions for, for Eli, um, but we're going to take questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to move, move swiftly on the hours late. Um, and we're going to get the clinical insights um, from Dr. Luke. I introduced Dr. Luke at the start of this webinar. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to Dr. Luke. Um, Dr. Luke, if you can unmute yourself as well, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks. Thanks, David. That's great. I've just shared my screen. Um, oh, I think you may have disabled my screen sharing, Adrian. But okay. Um, I think just uh, just first thing to say, um, Ali, and to everyone, th thanks for having me along. It's a remarkable um, story of survival, and uh, honoured to be invited along to talk to you today. Really, don't know how to to follow that really, but um, I think it's really important we remember that. We often focus, and certainly I do, uh, in all of my uh, discussions on um, the population messages, the data. We hear about deaths per day. We hear about hospitalizations. Um, but it's really important to remember behind that data that there's human beings and there's stories, uh, both patients like yourself, but also the doctors. You know, it was good to see Dr. Dr. Uh, Jim on there. Uh, talking about you know he him facing um, those those difficult and agonising situations as well. So um, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal to hear. So uh, what I thought I'd do is just take you through some of the um, I suppose what we know and what we've learned over the last um, twelve months. Really, you know, this emerged as a as a new disease, and uh, therefore we didn't understand its mechanism of action and the kind of things it was it was um, causing. Um, if we just pop onto the next slide. And therefore, we didn't know how to treat it either. And so we've learned so much um, over the past 12 months. And I think it's important to share 
uh, some of that with you as well. So I'm going to cover uh, several areas. And as I say, I'm happy to take questions at the end and just cover them in um, you know, very high level, but just to give you an idea of where we are. So something around the current numbers, um, what the country, country comparative data looks like uh, around the treatment of COVID-19 is really interesting where we've moved to on that. As I say, it was a new disease. We didn't really understand it. We now know there's lots that we can do um, to support people who suffer from the more severe COVID-19. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the vaccines and then just some long COVID insights. You'll be, you'll be hearing quite a bit about this over the, the coming months and, um, and years, I imagine, as we understand more about the impact of, of the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. Um, next slide, please, Adrian. Uh, so this was just to highlight where we are and really you know, just the impact this has had in 12 months. Uh, it, it's quite astonishing. This was from data from last week, but you know, 2 million, over 2 million um, deaths related to this um, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, and over 100 million cases confirmed. And of course, for every uh, death that we have recorded and confirmed case we have recorded, there's a lot more behind the scenes that, that may not have been tested, may not have been recorded properly. So we expect the, the impact and the, the death toll and, and cases to be probably a lot higher than, than what we're seeing on these, these numbers. Um, next slide, please, Adrian. Uh, so this was just to highlight some of the, the, the comparative data between the countries that we've, we've seen um, you know, since I last spoke to you. Um, you know, this is fascinating. What, why, why is Spain and the UK and Italy, what, why, are, why are we all up there? with you know, these excess deaths and high rates of death uh, you know, related to COVID compared to other countries. And um, lots and lots of theories, as you can imagine, have been put forward um, as to why this is the case. And I think the, the bottom line here is it's going to take a long time for us to really understand um, why that is the case and what the data is really showing. Um, lots of reasons for this. If we just jump onto the next page, it just gives a, some idea here of um, what we're kind of looking at in terms of, um, I suppose, uh, factors that may play into why we, we got, you know, such a, a bad hit in the UK. And clearly, we know that the genetic makeup is a, is a factor and how you respond to the virus and have a very bad immune response to it can play a role. Underlying health conditions, so diabetes, obesity, cardiac problems can all play a role. Um, the age of the population as a whole, you know, we've got an elderly population, an aging population in the UK. Um, vitamin D levels were raised very early on, and I may have mentioned this in when we, when we first spoke, around very low levels of vitamin D in the kind of northern hemisphere countries, resulting in, um, in, resulting in an effect on the immune, sy immune system. Um, the mixing of age groups, so, you know, elderly and, and young people mixing quite a lot, that was uh, postulated as a cause for the, the high death rate in Italy. Um, the population density, um, also an issue, you know, people living in close proximity to each other. The previous flu season's been looked at, so if we had a previously very bad flu season, um, maybe that a lot of people died then that, that maybe weren't around to be hit by the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus the, the following year. Um, adherence to initial and ongoing interventions that, that have been brought in by the government. And then finally, which I think is starting to gain some traction, um, is the differences between countries' um, border controls. Uh, and you'll have seen in the UK really a, a, a tightening of those. Um, but if you look back to somewhere like Thailand in, in March of last year, they effectively closed their country down and allowed nobody to enter without 14 days of quarantine in a state facility. Um, and you could only enter the country if you had a kind of presidential decree, um, and, and their cases have been very low. Now, bottom line here, I think what we will find is all of these reasons, and many that I haven't gone into here, will play a role in why some countries uh, have seen a very high death rate, and while um, some countries have seen a much lower death rate. And I imagine it's multifactorial and, and a combination of all these reasons brought together. But we'll know more. It's an emerging area that's being looked at. Uh, just on to the next slide, um, Adrian, thanks. And I thought this was really interesting. So again, if we go back to March, um, all of my colleagues, I, I don't work on the front line anymore, but, but I've got several friends that do uh, work like um, 
Dr. Jim that um, work at UCH at the front line. And I remember them saying to me, we've seen nothing like this before. We've seen nothing like this disease, what it's doing to people. We're treating them like they've got a pneumonia, like you would normally treat them. And they're dying. They're not surviving. We're putting them on a ventilator. They're dying. They're showing bizarre symptoms and, and uh, conditions like, you know, Ellie described. No one could understand it. And so what quickly um, happened was that the medical profession really did their research, did their sharing of data and information and found that this, this virus caused the blood to become very thick. It, it clotted more easily and that was causing a lot of the problems. So what we did was kind of learn on the go really um, about what treatments worked and what didn't. And this, this table here just really shows some of the areas that, that now have emerging evidence. Uh, and by that, I mean, they've been studied in a clinical setting. Um, so things like antivirals, remdesivir, which was the original Ebola drug, now has some good to moderate to good evidence that it's, it's useful in moderate to severe cases. You'd have heard about the use of steroids. So a certain type of steroid, a mineral or corticoid called dexamethasone, um, really good evidence that if you need oxygen and you're given dexamethasone, your mortality rate, your risk of dying comes down. Hydroxychloroquine, the, the much um, touted um, drug, malarial drug, that um, anti-malarial drug that Trump um, uh, mentioned, there's no evidence that has come out of the studies around that. Vitamin D, there is some good emerging evidence about its role in, in maybe making sure that we you know, have a less chance of catching COVID, but also don't get it as severe. Um, we heard Ellie talk about being um, intubated and ventilated um, on, on, on an intensive care unit. And interestingly now, um, the, the medics have learned that actually using non-invasive ventilation with face masks uh, and proning the patients, the patients lying on their tummy, um, has really good evidence now. And so actually at the moment, you are, you are likely to get ventilated much later in the course of your illness because they will try and not ventilate you. Um, until you really, really need it. So it's delayed. Anticoagulation, so that's thinning of the blood. Really good evidence around that, that we need to keep the blood thin to stop it clotting and causing uh, organ damage. There's some new drugs um, or repurposed drugs, um, uh, such as Actemra, which also are very useful. And then disappointingly, um, we've seen that monoclonal antibodies, so taking blood and antibodies from people who've survived COVID, um, and giving them to people who've got active COVID hasn't really um, provided um, the, the positive effect that's needed or wanted or would have liked to have been seen. Um, so that, that's good news about treating. So we're in a very different position from when Ellie was, um, was admitted to ITU. We know much more about the disease, much more how, uh, how it works and causes damage to the body. And we have some, um, we have some treatments that we know now work and actually in development are drugs to combat directly. So antiviral drugs, anti-COVID drugs are in development now. So um, there is a, a, a more than a glimmer of hope that um, in the future, um, acute severe COVID-19 will be treatable, um, you know, much more quickly and effectively than, than what Ellie um, experienced. Um, just onto the next slide, thanks Adrian. So I want to give you a bit of an up, update around the vaccine. You know, there's loads out there in the in the media around this um, regarding the rollout programs, the dosing schedules, um, whether there's you know risk of allergic reaction. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a bit of an overview of what what's happening in the kind of vaccine world at the moment. Um, so just next slide, please. Um, now I thought this was interesting. So. Um, this was um, a survey that um, Adrian kindly shared with me, the outputs, which show that, you know, when they um, looked at the population in the UK and surveyed adults, 78% said that they would be very or fairly likely to have the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think while that sounds like a high figure, that does show that there is 22%, you know, and split, split across the, the UK, millions of people, who would not consider having um, or, or be less likely to have the COVID-19 vaccine, which shows there is a concern out there around, um, you know, what the vaccine is, what the vaccine does. And some of those kind of conspiracy theories are gaining hold 
uh, in different communities. Um, so it's still a worry because obviously the vaccines are the way out of this um, crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, this is taken from possibly about 10 days ago now, but this is around the, the rollout. And, and as you will know, Israel have, have hit the ground running with this and done an absolutely phenomenal job. Um, we're not that far behind. Uh, this is two weeks ago now, so we're catching up um, and we're doing quite well in the UK. Um, and as you'll know, there's... Um, lots of concern elsewhere in, in Europe um, around the rollout and, and in other countries. And, um, you know, the danger here is we do revert to some of what we've seen, which is, um, you know, this kind of vaccine nationalism. Um, you know, we know um, that the, the best thing is to target people um, who most need the vaccine, and I'll come on to that, and get them, get them vaccinated quickly. We'll, we'll have the greatest effect on globally on global society as a whole. Um, next slide, please. So um, this one is just, just mentioning the, um, the uh, vaccines that are now available in the UK. So we've got the Pfizer vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the Moderna vaccine. The, the last one of these is not available at the moment. I think uh, we're due to get supplies around March or April. Um, as you will know, the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are the ones being rolled out. Um, and uh, the Pfizer one is the one that needs really cold temperature storage, so um, creates logistical problems for um, for people to um, administer, store, and move it around the country. Um, but as I say, in the UK, we're, we're doing really well at, at getting this vaccine into people's arms. The dosing schedule is quite interesting, so lots of debate on this. And you know, if you ask 100 doctors, you'll get 200 different answers. Um, around some of these approaches. So we've delayed the second dose of the, of the Pfizer vaccine um, and there's some concern about whether we'll lose the effect. You know, I think, I think we have to go with the, um, the Joint Committee on Vaccinations that, that advises the government. They're an independent body. Um, they've studied the data and, and their approach has been to vaccinate as many people quickly with the first dose as they can. And um, I think there's about to be some um, evidence published around that in the next week or two uh, that it really isn't doing much harm. Um, just on to the next slide. Am I frozen there slightly? Oh, there we go. So, so this is, um, this is um, a really interesting um, two questions, which I keep getting asked on pretty much every talk I, um, I do, which is, why is the UK targeting the vaccinations at the at-risk groups, the vulnerable? And why didn't we go in and vaccinate the, um, the working age group, the students, get the schools open, get the economy up and running, um, get society opened up earlier? Why didn't we do that? I think the first thing to say on this slide is just to look at the, the cumulative um, death data that you can see here. Um, and these are the vaccination groups that are being targeted. Um, and you can see the impact um, is considerable in these groups. But I think if we just jump onto the next slide, and I think th this was a very difficult decision, I imagine, for, you know, not that I was party to it, but very difficult decision for, um, for the, the joint committee and the government to decide who to vaccinate first. Um, you know, do you get the country up and running? Uh, get young people vaccinated or do you vaccinate the vulnerable? And really that decision came down to the fact that when they did the modelling, which I'll come on to, that that modelling showed that by vaccinating um, younger people, working age population, we would not get the impact on hospitalisation and on deaths quickly enough. And therefore potentially the UK's National Health Service would fall over and be unable to cope. This is a slide I may have shown you previously, um, Sorry, it's very small. There's a bit of scribble on the on the um, on the slide. I don't know if you're seeing that as well, but um, um, I can't get rid of the scribble, unfortunately. Uh, but okay. no problem. They're not the attendees to that's scribble right. somewhere else. <laughs> that's right, no problem. So um, you can see here, I've just put three red arrows on there. This is showing these little kind of um, black uh, dots. If you look at those, the further to the right is your more is the more or higher chance of you dying if you get COVID. And you won't, if you can make that big, you'll be able to see that they, um, 
if you look at that first red arrow, that shows that if you're over 70 to 80, your risk goes up 10, 12 times of dying. Uh, if you're male, your risk goes up as well. The second arrow down is if you're obese and you're, the third arrow down is if you've got diabetes, you know, you're two or three times more likely to die. So those at-risk groups um, are the real um, worrying, vulnerable part of the population that would end up potentially getting quite severe COVID, getting into hospital, and then unfortunately, many of them would die. Um, next um, slide, please, Adrian. And this is again, just demonstrating why um, the government went down this route. Um, this, is, um, this is based on US data, but it shows the risk of dying here to so case fatality rate um, on the right-hand table. If you're under nine, it's 0.1%. If you're over 80, it's 28.7%. So you can see there that there's just a huge dis, um, uh, band between um, age nine up to kind of 70, where your risk is pretty low. And then it was modeled on the graph on the left. It was modeled around if you vaccinated all the over 80s, all the over 70s, all the over 60s. And you can see there that the infection fatality rate, so the risk of um, that the rate of people dying from COVID infection comes down quite rapidly if you target that elderly population. So um, again, this was based on US data, but this is the kind of um, decisions the government was kind of weighing up and, and trying to decide who they should target the vaccinations at. Um, just onto the next slide. Um, so this is another slide um, Adrian shared with me recently, and this is um, um, some work done by a group uh, of COVID-19 actuaries response group, which, which, um, which Adrian is, is part of. And um, this again shows the impact of vaccination. Um, it's just chopped off, I'm afraid, the, um, the dates at the bottom. But um, as you come across and begin that vaccinating, your cases drop by 15%, your ICU admissions drop, your hospital admissions drop, and your deaths drop. Um, and this is, I suppose, projecting forward what we hope to see. Now on the next slide, um, I think it should show, uh, ah, it's not, it's on my other one, I'm afraid. There's a, there's a great slide, which I don't know whether it'll let me share my screen, um, Adrian, no. Um, so it's a great slide, which I will pop in the chat, um, which is um, data that's just come out um, from, from Israel on their program. And it's showing a really, really positive effect from their vaccination using the Pfizer vaccine um, on hospitalizations um, in those that have received the vaccines. It, it's really uh, quite a remarkable slide and I think really gives us um, a real hope that the vaccinations are going to have the impact we, we want them to have. But I'll, I'll maybe share that around in the, the chat group afterwards or, or over to Adrian in a, in a moment. Um, the worry, of course, um, is uh, the, the new variants. And, you know, viruses mutate. That's what they do. They, they change and they respond. And the, the more they're circulating around the, the environment, the more they will change. And that's why we've had a further lockdown, mask wearing, et cetera. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, going to, that's going to happen. So we shouldn't be too alarmed by... The, the fact we're getting variants, that's, that's going to happen. At the moment, we've seen this UK variant. There is, you'll have heard of the Brazilian variant called P1, and there's a South African variant called B1351. And the concern is that these new types of COVID, these new variants, um, transmit more easily. So um, will pass from person to person and stick much more easily. Um, they could be resistant to the vaccines and they may cause more severe disease and death. And I think the first thing to say is, again, a lot of this is emerging evidence. We don't know yet um, for sure what many of these variants um, will cause. We know that the UK variant is likely to be much more transmissible. It just passes on a lot easier. We don't yet know whether it is more likely to kill you or cause you to have severe disease. What we do know about the Brazilian and the South African variant is it looks like they are more resistant to the current vaccines. And that's because they have these mutations in um, the spikes. So you'll have all seen the pictures of the coronavirus with its spikes. 
Um, and that's what attaches to the, the human cells. And the Brazilian and the South African variant have a, a mutation in that area of the spike. And that's what the vaccine targets. So that's, that's a worry. However, and again, I think we need to remain upbeat around this, is that now that we have the basis for the vaccines, we produce all of these vaccines, they can be now very easily tweaked to respond to these variants. So I think as much as you will read in the media that this is a real worry, um, it is a worry, but we've got through the past 12 months and we've produced vaccines on a, on a timescale like we have never imagined before. It's normally 10 years to produce a vaccine and we've produced how many in, in um, you know, six, seven, eight that are now in, into market. You know, there's the Russian one, there's the Chinese one, we've got three in the UK. Um, we've produced these within a year. So, so we should be really, really positive that we can respond to these variants um, and then we can um, tweak the vaccines we've got. It is very likely that we will need to have a vaccination program very much like we do for flu. So an annual vaccination against COVID is, um, is a very likely outcome. And then the, the vaccinations will be tweaked so that they match the variants that are circulating in, um, in the local environment. I think just finally to say, um, we're going to see some degree of lockdown eased. There's no doubt in the UK in the next few months. My guess is that that's going to be extremely gradual. I think the, the government and um, the Department of Health have learned that you know, by simply removing lockdown for everything, we've seen spikes. The last thing they would want is a, um, as a further um, uh, rise and, and wave of cases. Um, I think international travel is going to be hit for a long time because of these new variants. The last thing we would want to do is probably open up the country, get everyone traveling back and forth again and bring in new variants. That, that would be, a, a, again, a disaster. So they're my speculations. Um, not sure if um, what, what will come of that, but my expectation is a gradual loosening of lockdown um, followed by you know, a, a much tighter control on our, on our borders. And then finally, uh, just for me on long COVID. So um, lots of news and media attention on this at the moment, the NHS is setting up clinics. So this is talking about the implications of having had COVID. And, and I think if we just park the more severe end of the spectrum, um, you know, if you've been in hospital or, or worse, you know, like Ellie been in hospital and been intubated, there will clearly be health outcomes and you will need rehab after that. But, but what we're also seeing is a picture of people who've had mild COVID infections and some who may not have even known they've had COVID develop um, problems that are now being described as long COVID. And they are a multitude of symptoms from fatigue, from brain fog and confusion to um, digestive problems, to uh, difficulty smelling um, and tasting, um, fatigue uh, and these these things are being reported in in increasing numbers of people who have had um, a confirmed COVID infection and three or four months later are still suffering some kind of symptoms so again all of this is emerging um, clinical data and, and clinical evidence but we are likely to see more and more discussion of this in the months and years to come um, as we see the effect of COVID-19 infections are having on people, even in people who didn't have it very severely. So um, it's a kind of watch this space on, on long COVID, but it, but it will gain increasing traction, I think. When you think of the number of people in the world that have had this infection, um, you will see a, a many people suffer from kind of ill health for a long time following this. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm aware I've been going on for a bit, so um, I will stop and hand back to Adrian. Um, great, thank you very much, Dr. Luke. It was um, fascinating, um, informative, um, and sort of very, very much um, very covering very current issues and sort of as well as the outlook. Um, we, we are going to allow a little bit of time for questions. Um, if sort of given the number of participants on this, um, we're going to use the chat uh, for questions. Uh, I think there have been quite a lot of questions and comments along the way throughout the chat. Um, but if I can just start with a question, and actually it's to you, Dr. Luke. Um, so, so I think I think we heard in Ellie's story that um, sort of prior to the, the 26th or 27th of March, 
he'd been feeling unwell for about a week. Beforehand, so so given given everything that we've learned over the year, what's your advice to people if you feel unwell right now? Sorry, Adrian, I think you've got me muted from your Sorry. Right. You're controlling it well. Uh, sorry, I, I only caught the end of that, but I think about people who maybe were feeling unwell um, at yeah, present. What's, what's your advice to people feeling unwell now? What should they be doing? Yeah, well, so they've been waiting till um, blood oxygen levels fall, fall to dangerous levels. Yeah, so I think the number one message here is that the system is open. Um, the NHS is open for business, so there's a, been a lot of concern that people are not accessing healthcare when they should for everything. But certainly if you have any of those symptoms, so, you know, the shortness of breath and the cough, persistent cough, um, you need to seek medical advice. We're now in a position um, in the UK where we can get things like oxygen sats out to you at home. In fact, you can buy them off um, Amazon. They're, they're you know, relatively cheap um, and you can monitor that yourself. So. Yes, instead, you know, instead of waiting at home thinking that this might get better, get early in medical intervention, get your oxygen levels checked um, and, and, and seek early advice, because I think the earlier we can intervene, the less likely it is that, that you'll deteriorate now. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to try and work my way through through the chat and I'm sort of starting at the bottom. Um, there's a question around pregnant women um, and there are lots of mixed opinions on pregnant women and taking the vaccine if you're pregnant? Yep, so for, for some of the vaccines, um, there is concern about giving the, um, giving the vaccine because it doesn't, it's not been produced in the, the same way as traditional vaccines. So, um, so the, the Moderna vaccine um, is not produced in the same way and it will depend on the local licensing, whether they feel they have enough data and evidence around use in, in pregnant women. So um, the, the most important thing is if you are pregnant to get that medical advice uh, in the region you're in um, and, and see what your physician would say as to whether you should have the vaccine um, or not. Okay. Um. Hi, Adrian. Uh, is it possible to uh, unmute Dr. Luke? Can everybody hear me? I don't think Adrian is on the call at the moment, which is why the uh, host has come across to yourself. 
Right. Uh, Dr. Luke, can, you, can we hear you? You may, Lawrence, you may need to unmute Dr. Luke from your side. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I lost Adrian and I think he has to unmute me. Um, I can run down and see if picked up um picked up any of the um the questions off the chat if is that i think that's what adrian was doing anyway so we've got here um what supplements can be taken before the virus gets a foothold to ensure things don't deteriorate well it, there's no evidence that supplements of any kind um will um necessarily affect either one um not catching the virus or two um getting worse from the virus what there is is around vitamin D is some emerging evidence that a lot of people who were admitted to hospital with severe COVID um, had very low vitamin D levels. And so making sure that you keep your vitamin D levels up, simple supplement um, most days is, is sensible. And, and actually the Public Health England recommend that anyway um, within the UK. So they recommend adults to take a small dose of vitamin D during the winter months anyway. Um, there's a question on here around anaphylaxis, so an allergic reaction. Um, what, what does somebody do around the vaccine? So again, the, the first thing to note here is that the CDC has just published some data that show that the risk of a severe allergic reaction um, that could kill you, but is treatable um, and so manageable, um, is the risk is about 11 people getting an allergic reaction in a million doses of vaccine given. So 11 in, 11 in 1 million chance of, um, of, of getting an anaphylactic reaction, which remember can be treated. And they normally happen in the first 15 minutes or so after you've had the vaccine. So that's a pretty low risk. If you compare um, that to another risk, so your risk of being knocked over by a car in the UK and killed in the next year is about one in 20,000. So you can see that the risk of the vaccine around an anaphylactic reaction is actually very, very small. And when we compare it to other risks in life, it, it shouldn't put people off. If you've had a previous anaphylactic reaction, you should clearly discuss with your doctor and make the doctors or the vaccinators aware that you've had a, a previous um, anaphylactic reaction. Uh, Dr. Luke, one more question that came through on the chat was, there's a lot of talk about wearing double masks now, and I think in Germany they're talking about um, only wearing N95 masks. Is that something we should be looking at? Um, yes, I think it is. I think what's fascinating, and I'll, I'll hold my hands up here, this time last year I was um, following what was the Public Health England advice, the, the World Health Organization advice, uh, at the time, we were we were briefing our um, colleagues and the public, uh, saying that masks were no good. Masks didn't work. They didn't protect you, and they didn't protect anyone else. And we we went out with that message. And um, clearly, what's happened then is we've done a complete about turn on this. And the evidence has come through that mask wearing does um, provide some degree of protection for both the wearer and other people. Now, there's three kind of grades of mask. Um, and you've got your kind of basic fabric mask, which will stop some transmission, but it's those higher end called FFP3s that are the big masks with the respirators on that, that clearly are the best ones, but aren't practical for everybody to have and wear and aren't really needed unless you're at the, the kind of front line uh, of dealing with patients who you know have got COVID. So the recommendation was to wear a fabric mask, um, now the evidence being looked at is whether actually that's going to be enhanced to either double mask wearing or moving up to the kind of the FFP2s masks. Um, at the moment, that guidance within the UK has not changed. And I think there'll be a reluctance to move to that for the benefits that will be gained now that we're on the vaccination programme. Um, I, I think there'll be a reluctance to move to kind of um, 
telling people to wear the higher grade masks. Great, thank you, Dr. Luke. Um, Ellie, have you got any questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Luke? Um, no, not really. I just want to thank Dr. Luke for his input. And my suggestion to people generally is, is to abide by the guidelines and let's not ask too many questions and let's hear what the professionals have got to say and do what's required. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, has anybody else got any questions they'd like to ask Ellie or Dr. Luke? Um, just pop it onto the chat board. Um, I know there are quite a few questions regarding uh, antibodies and immunity, etc. But I think, uh, Dr. Luke, you've covered most of that. Yeah, I think I think just to add that um, antibodies don't necessarily mean immunity, um, and we we don't know how long those antibodies last. So. Um, we think about five months now, but we don't know whether they still provide protection for you. Um, so that, that's something just to remember, just because you've got antibodies doesn't mean you should stop all the other um, uh, steps you're taking in terms of infection control. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Luke. Um, just on uh, behalf of uh, the Hebrew Order of David uh, International, I'd just like to say, just thank you so much uh, to Dr. Luke James for his time, his insights um, and updates on COVID. It's just fascinating. And I'm sure we could go on the whole evening. It's one of those topics. And uh, please God, we'll have you back um, in the not too distant future where we'll be talking about post COVID uh, times. Um, a huge thank you to Adrian Beska for hosting this evening and uh, for providing all that statistical information. And uh, the star, I suppose, of the evening is our miracle boy, Ellie. Um, you've just uh, an absolute inspiration. Um, you're a wonderful friend, a member of the HOD, and uh, words can't describe how pleased really we are to have you uh, with us this evening. Um, we hope you'll be with us for many, many years to come. Uh, we have much to do together in our charitable efforts and helping other people in need. Um, it just leaves me to say on behalf of the Hebrew Order of David International, a huge thank you to everybody. Thanks to those who've participated and come on to the talk this evening. Um, our blessing to you all is that you should all just stay safe and well. Um, God bless you all and thank you very much for attending. Good night all. Thank you.